everyone. Good morning um, and welcome to the second day of the Patchwork Ethnography webinar. Um, this introduction was meant to be given by my co-organizer, Chika Watanabe, but unfortunately she's having some internet issues and so um, I'm stepping in for her today. Um, my name is Saiba Varma. I'm an anthropologist at the University of California in San Diego. I'm a South Asian woman with long black hair. Um, I'm wearing a white blazer um, and a pink colored um, tank top underneath. It's uh, wonderful to be with all of you today. Um, and many thanks to everyone who was also with us yesterday. We had so many powerful papers and I uh, wanted to thank everyone who sent those wonderful comments to the presenters throughout the day. Someone in the audience asked yesterday how we can avoid the pitfall of presenting patchwork ethnography as patchy, somehow inferior to a fuller kind of ethnography. We, we thought this was a really great question. Um, a lot of the papers yesterday moved us in deep and sometimes difficult ways, but maybe that patchwork, um, not patchy, but the labor of patching together life itself is what a fuller ethnography would mean or look like. I'm sure the presenters today will help us think further about these questions. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. You'll see on your screens uh, that you have the chat box, which appears on the right-hand side um, and the Q&A box that you can click at the bottom. Please use the chat box if you have any questions or comments uh, for the panelists or for the organizers. The other audience members won't be able to see your questions in the chat, but they can see our answers if uh, and when we are able to answer your questions. If you have a question or comment that all panelists and attendees um, can see, please put it in the Q&A box. So this is the place where, uh, for example, after Danilin's talk, if you would like to ask a question, you could put your, put, put your question in the Q&A box. Uh, the presenters will be answering all of those questions, so not the ones in the chat. And don't worry if you get confused, we'll say this many times uh, over the course of the day. So we're really excited for, for both our panels today. And again, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, so we will begin with our first um, short talk for today. We're so delighted to have um, Danilyn Rutherford, who is the president of the Venergren Foundation for Anthropological Research and one of the funders and early supporters of patchwork ethnography. Um, Dr. Rutherford will give a 10 minute presentation and we will have also about 10 minutes for Q&A afterwards. So thank you so much, Danilyn, for being here. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And thank you to the organizers, the captioners and the interpreters. And of course, the wonderful panelists. I had a chance to watch yesterday and I really enjoyed every second of it. Um, I'm joining you from Manhattan, the traditional land of the Muncie Lenape people. I honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. I'm a 60 year old white woman with medium length graying hair and round glasses. I'm wearing a dark blue shirt. There's a large photograph of my daughter Millie behind me. It's such a pleasure to be part of this wonderful event. I've been happy to witness such a forceful intervention into anthropological business as usual. This project is giving me hope. I have the honor of introducing the next segment of the webinar, and I'd like to do so by saying a few words about why, both professionally and personally, the issues being discussed here are close to my heart. And I have some images to share, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Great, hopefully you guys can see that. The Wenneren Foundation was founded in 1941 by two men who knew very little about anthropology. Axel Wenergren, who's pictured here, head of the Electrolux Corporation and one of the richest men in the world, and Paul Feos. Uh, and I will show you a little bit, Electrolux Corporation, including refrigerators and vacuum cleaners. Um, and of course, he was the owner of many things, including large yachts. Um, the other man was Paul Feos, a Hungarian avant-garde filmmaker. It's a twisted tale. Wenergren created what was then called the Viking Fund 
when he had to sell um, a yacht in Florida and wanted to avoid paying US taxes. Um, initially, the fund was to support whatever. It was after meeting Paul Feos um, over cocktails, most likely on the yacht in Singapore, that he decided to dedicate the foundation to anthropology. Um, the first grant that Wenner, the Wenner grant, the Viking Fund funded was an amateur expedition to Peru that the two men took together. Um, we have lots of, uh, you know, upon the completion of this expedition, Paul Feos came home and consulted American anthropologists who trained him in the American brand of the field. Um, we have a lot of photographs from the old days, and I'll show you a few. Um, they all picture, uh, you know, and the people that they picture seem to have come off an assembly line, all white, all male, all typically embodied, pretty much all in suits. It's been a long struggle to move beyond uh, this aspect of our history. Um, and it's mostly been mounted by a series of female presidents from Lita Osmondson, who's shown here with Paul Feos, who was her husband, to Seidel Silverman, to Leslie Ayello, to me. And it's interesting to note how women, especially women of color, like Lita Osmondson, have historically borne an unequal burden when it comes to service to the discipline. At the same time, you know, I need to say, just again, inspired by yesterday's presentations, my predecessors and I are about as privileged as you can get. I see my job as a form of housekeeping, an ethical form of housekeeping, for better, not for worse, at least as I see it. And here I agree with Megan Moody on the ethics of service to our field. But I have to note that it has been gendered traditionally, uh, nonetheless. Uh, but it's an accident that the Wendergren Foundation exists as a resource for the worldwide community of anthropologists. I think of our mission as to save anthropology and to make sure anthropology is worth saving. But to do this, we've had to take a hard look at ourselves. A few years ago, and I'm gonna stop sharing right now. A few years ago, we developed a strategic plan, our first since 1987. Some key priorities emerged from this process amplifying the impact of anthropology, addressing the precarity of anthropology and anthropologists, and fostering an inclusive vision of the field, all of which helped us meet our main goal, which, to, which is to expand and deepen the knowledge anthropologists produce. When the organizers of this webinar approached us for a workshop grant, it was pretty much a slam dunk. Personally, I knew I'd learn a lot from the conversation. We were in the midst of developing new programs, our global initiatives grants, which supports capacity building projects, the Wenergren seminars, which will provide a platform for intergenerational conversations, and the engaged research grants, which will support research partnerships designed to empower those who have historically been among those researched in anthropology. The conversation also promised to speak to some of the questions I've begun asking myself about biases built into our processes. We collect CVs from applicants for our research grants. Is a long list of publications an indicator of excellence or privilege? We have postdoctoral fellowships reserved for scholars less than 10 years past their PhD. What factors determine who is in a position to write a book at this point in their career? Conversations with colleagues in the Global South had alerted me to the colonial premises behind much dissertation funding, which presumes students learn theory here in the North and do research there in the South in an extended, continuous bout of fieldwork. Conversations with colleagues in Europe had alerted me to the hardships baked into the profession over there. In the US, we think of large collaborative projects as revolutionary but they have spawned a class of underpaid scholars who spend their careers moving from one European city to another with a little hope of ever securing a permanent post. In these circumstances, it's hard to have a home life, let alone balance it with a career. Another lesson for Wenergren, we need to be vigilant when it comes to the hidden costs of what look like good ideas. Then 2020 hit and changes we've been playing with making suddenly seemed urgent. With the global pandemic and the ongoing worldwide struggle for racial justice, one thing has become clear. It's not just a question of what research can be done, but what research should be done, given the burdens so many around the world and in our discipline are facing and have been facing over so much of anthropology's history. 
The challenges are theoretical, methodological, but above all, ethical. There's talk in some quarters of our field about getting back to business as, us as usual. In my mind, business as usual is over. In November 2020, we started asking applicants to submit a plan B, a scheme for conducting research if the field work they thought they were doing proved impossible. And I'll add, uh, because this came up in the um, question and answer you know, field yesterday, uh, we also at the same time encourage applicants to expand their repertoire of methods, doing a bunch of the things that you know, in the past we haven't done in this kind of rush to the face-to-face -face and romanticization of a particular kind of image of what field work is, encouraging people to learn from archives, to learn from other scholars, but above all, to learn to, from both critics and allies of the people they're working with in the field. At the same time, we expanded the expenses we would cover in a budget. We now cover living expenses wherever you are and the full cost of childcare. And these changes I would want to add to everyone here are really here to stay. Um, from here on out, it seems to me that there is no more plan A. The days of uninterrupted solitary research in an extractive mode are gone. Then there are the personal resonances. I've never done anything other than patchwork ethnography, and for much of my career, this has been a source of shame. I did my first stint of dissertation research while living with my partner in London, traveling back and forth across the English Channel on short archival expeditions to the Netherlands. I wanted to do fieldwork in Indonesian occupied West Papua. I claimed in my funding proposals that I'd be there for 12 months, but I really had no idea whether I'd ever be able to get in. My second project in West Papua was supposed to involve six months of fieldwork among Papuan exiles in the Netherlands, followed by six months as a visiting professor in West Papua. But then our beautiful, deeply unusual daughter, Millie, was born. I spent that year taking her to therapy sessions three times a week, punctuated by short trips to meet Papuan activists in various cities around the world. My trip to West Papua was whittled down to a month. Two months later, after I returned, my partner died. Millie was three and not learning to talk. We'd just gotten her her first wheelchair. Ralph, her older brother, was six. It was two weeks before I would learn whether or not I had gotten tenure. For my third project, I gave up on fieldwork altogether and drew almost exclusively on archival sources. And for my fourth project, I've dispensed with the boundary between home and field altogether. I'm writing about Millie and how she's changed the way I think about communication and the making of social worlds. When Willie was diagnosed, I cried over what I took to be my destroyed academic career. In retrospect, this was ridiculous. I still feel like I could be doing more, more field work, more reading, more writing, but I'm trying to be less hard on myself and this event is helping. Living anthropologically, living in awareness of difference and connection of the context, obvious and hidden, that shape who we are and what we can do can be a valid source of insight more valid, as these marvelous papers suggest, than the ideal model of research ever could be. All this is to say, I'm delighted this is happening and delighted to be on hand. This event has the potential to spark real changes in our discipline. It's been great so far, and I'm really looking forward to what is to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan, and then for that really beautiful knitting together of um, institutional history and also the personal history, which I think is so much of what our patchwork is about. Just a message to our attendees, if you would like to ask a question, please um, use the Q&A box because uh, we are unfortunately unable to hear you. So if you raise your hand, um, we, we won't be able to call on you. Um, one question for you, Daniel, and maybe just to get the conversation going is, um, could you give some examples of the hidden costs that you talked about of things that seemed like good ideas, but in fact ended up being counterproductive. Um, and relatedly, uh, what do you feel like are the obstacles to change the norms of funding agencies and any tips or advice that you might have for both junior scholars as well as uh, people trying to sort of innovate methodologically? 
Yeah, well, thank you so much. I mean, I think for me, the most enlightening example was the one I mentioned, you know, just from the US perspective. I was at UC Santa Cruz before coming to Wintergren and, you know, through Anna Singh learned about these great collaborative projects she was doing around inequality and the Anthropocene involving these whole sets of scholars. And it seemed really wonderful. You know, I'm sure her projects really were, but just the dangers of hierarchy creeping back into collaboration. That's something I think we really, really need to keep an eye on. And it kind of made me realize that one of our, you know, longest standing programs, the Hunt Postdoctoral Fellowship for Ethnographic Writing, could be very meaningful to our junior colleagues in Europe, you know, who often finish and have no time to actually have their own voice be heard, right? So that was just an interesting point for me. Um, more recently, you know, um, we're in an interesting position because Wintergren supports anthropology worldwide. Historically, we've been very bad at supporting um, scholars based in institutions in the global South. I'm always pushing for inclusion internationally, you know, but I think that's really important to think about because we organize seminars, we organize symposia, we have some say in the participants and pushing to be inclusive along every single dimension can result in a certain kind of tokenism where there's not sort of a center of gravity to actually have a live sort of friction and coming together of different paradigms. So that's another thing I'm really having to think hard about. Um, you know, and again, on the international fronts, there's scholars based in the global South, but then there's also marginalization and minoritization within those contexts too. So really trying to think hard about those issues as well. You know, so I think just always being vigilant to the way in which power relations creep into what we're doing. The point not just being to have an ethics of egalitarianism, that's fine, but I see it as critical to supporting deep and um, penetrating and effective anthropological knowledge to really have an idea on these things that really warp what it is we can know. Um, Thank you. Um, you have some more questions pouring in. Um, I can field them for you if you'd like. Uh, okay. So sure. question from Michelle, who was our uh, panelist yesterday, uh, Michelle Friedner. Thank you for a wonderful opening. I really appreciate your comments about plan A's and plan B's. And it's interesting to think about how developing plans in and of themselves are fraught. How can a research plan as written for either a funding agency or for oneself, allow for open-endedness and contingencies. Mm -hmm. This way we ideally, ideally would not need A, B, C, D, and so on. Yeah, no, that's a really great question. I mean, um, you know, I did a lot of sort of public webinars for prospective applicants when we were moving over to this new system. And, you know, maybe I'm a bit of a salesperson, but one of the things, you know, I tried to tell them is actually this is a really good thing for your thinking, right? To be able to pitch a question at a level at which it both grips the ground in terms of concrete experiences, but it's open to a range. There are different avenues that you can take to kind of get at an answer to that question. So having that kind of nimbleness, I think is something that you know, anthropologists who are just getting started in the field right now, they're getting schooled in that in a way that's going to be really productive, I think, for the rest of their career. Um, so, you know, I would hope that going forward, there's just going to be one plan, but our reviewers are still going to be looking for that kind of nimbleness, right? Where there are a range of different possibilities for pursuing a question. Maybe it's folded into the same methods section. Um, the other thing just to say about this, you know, Michelle, and this helped me, you know, and it's ironically enough in this position, you know, I got a bunch of grants for my dissertation fieldwork. I don't think I'm a great grant writer, like traditionally, I don't think I'm someone who every time I apply for something, I hit it out of the park, you know, but one of the ways that I kind of have tried to talk myself into figuring out this genre is pretending I'm the kind of person who knows how to do this, right? So in a sense, you know, when our reviewers are looking at funding proposals, we're not kind of approving the plan we're approving the planner. You know, what we wanna know is we're investing in a person who's capable of coming up with anthropological ways of knowing a very complicated, uncertain world, right? So it's an act of the imagination to come up with that kind of problem and that kind of plan, you know, and it's not just COVID that's led people to change their designs, to change their budget. It happens all the time. We're totally aware of that. You know, the world shifts from under us over six months 
in any kinds of circumstances. So we're totally aware that people are not gonna be able to carry out their field work exactly as they planned. But what we're looking at in that proposal is, are you able to kind of come up with an idea? Are you able to insert yourself into a range of conversations? Are you able to come up with a range of different strategies for addressing that kind of, you know, that problem that have to do with being in the world and letting the world push back on you? You know, do you have the preparation? Do you have the commitment? Where does your passion come from? All of these things are what we're looking for in the proposal. So it's not the plan we're really approving in the end, it's the planner, right? So I guess that would be one thing to say to students who are just, you know, starting to kind of get versed in this genre is it's an act of the imagination and everyone involved realizes it, right? You still need to be serious. Is this something feasible? Is this something can work that can work? But just to recognize that you know, we wouldn't be anthropologists if we didn't realize that the world is uncertain. That's just like, we're set up to deal with that as a discipline. That's part of who we are, um, so, yeah. I think that's really helpful feedback to be able to kind of write more of yourself into it. And also to be, like you said, kind of be able to move between different possibilities and not, you know, feel like you have to fully go down just one path, commit yourself to just one approach. Um, I'm sure that's quite reassuring for a lot of people to hear. Um, several people in the Q&A also um, just wanted to thank you for being so open and vulnerable with us. And um, maybe just as a kind of closing question, bringing it back to the kind of intimate and, and personal, uh, there's a question from Saima Khan. How did you deal with the emotional distress after your partner's passing and daughter's illness and what kept you motivated for research? Did you feel exhausted in your journey? Well, that's actually, that's a great question. I mean, um, I think that was the moment at which I really became committed to the idea that for all of their hierarchies and all of the baloney and institutions, you know, a department is a community. Um, you know, my colleagues I was on at the University of Chicago kind of came together around me in ways I had never expected. You know, I was really, like I said, I've been inordinately privileged throughout my career. You know, I was given time off. I actually ended up doing a bunch of art. I took watercolor classes. You know, I learned to be the head of a household, which I very much wasn't. I was kind of, I mean, you know, I hate to say it's like my husband, my, you know, my late husband did everything. He cooked, he cleaned, he made the money. You know, it's just like, I had to kind of like figure out all of that. So I actually took quite a bit of time really away and doing things that you know just felt right to do but then when i came back i came back with i think in some ways a healthier perspective than i'd ever had you know i kind of had gotten tenure right i used to tell students like there are two things that happen when you get tenure you either get magisterial or you get perverse <laughs> you know i mean for me it was definitely getting perverse you know just really okay i have this job what makes this life worth living? You know, what makes this job worth doing? And just kind of realizing a work with students and service to students was incredibly important. And the opportunity this field gives us to let our curiosity wander and just the pleasure of writing, you know? So I think in a sense, kind of coming back to the things about this work that give pleasure and someone was talking about pleasure yesterday it's not just fun you know I think that was really that kind of really hit me I can't remember which talk it was but yeah that sense that there is a reason why we're in this and just not letting all the careerism all the baloney kind of get in the way of just what is the sheer pleasure of being out there in the world and letting the world kind of touch you the way world the world touches you when you're an anthropologist you know so um, yeah, so that's kind of a short thing. Um, yeah, and then I mean, the other side is I had to get learn to be extremely efficient, <laughs> you know, which did not come naturally. So that's, that's the other part of the story as everyone who's here who's a single mom, you know, can tell you. Um, but yeah. So things that definitely pull you in different directions as well. Um, thank you so much. This was such a beautiful opening for our second day. Um, Really the perfect note to start on and if you have a chance look through the q a um after afterwards if you'd like just to see all the comments pouring in okay. um thank you so much to our audience uh we will be taking a, 
five minute break now before panel one begins. Please don't log off, just um, stay on, but feel free to get some water or walk around or uh, whatever, whatever you need um, for the next five minutes. Thank you so much again, Dan Thanks. Thank you.